Welcome to you all, wherever you may be as we worship together today, Monday the 31st of August. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Our reading today comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning at the 16th verse. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive, and of recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today that scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure thyself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of a hill, on which their town was built, that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. So as the reading opens, we find Jesus in the town synagogue. It's a Sabbath day. He gets up to read the scripture and comments on it. The passage he reads is full of significance. It comes from the prophet Isaiah, and Jesus' reading of it amounts to a manifesto, or what we might call today a mission statement. Books in those days were in the form of scrolls, and the scriptures were kept in a special place in the synagogue and given to the reader by an attendant. Jesus may have chosen the passage himself, or it may have been assigned for that day. But it's more than just a mission statement. As he reads it, it becomes clear that the whole statement is about Jesus himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This has already been confirmed during his baptism in the River Jordan, when the Holy Spirit came down on him in the form of a dove, and a voice was heard to say, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Because he has anointed me, in saying this, Jesus is making an unequivocal claim to be the Messiah or the Christ, the long-awaited liberating King of Israel. And then comes the mission of this King. To preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are hurt and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. There's nothing here of restoring the glories of Israel, nothing about conquering enemies and laying waste their lands. No, it's about letting the poor of this world hear the good news of God's love for them. It's about healing and reconciliation. It's about liberating those who are tied down by any form of enslavement. It's about helping people to see clearly the true meaning of life. It's about restoring wholeness to people's lives and to societies. It's about the inauguration of the kingdom 
by its king. It is, in short, the whole picture of Jesus that will unfold in the pages of Luke, a gospel which focuses on the poor and the vulnerable, a gospel of tenderness and compassion, a gospel of the spirit and of joy, a gospel of prayer and healing. And as he finishes the reading, Jesus puts down the scroll and said that these things were now being fulfilled as they were hearing them. And his hearers were surprised at the way he spoke, but they were not moved to change. After all, he was just the son of Joseph, wasn't he? And someone they knew so well could have nothing to say to them. At the same time, Jesus says they, his own townspeople, must be wondering why he is not doing the things in Nazareth that he was doing in places like Capernaum. The reason for their non-acceptance is they don't really accept him for what he is. He reminds them that prophets are seldom accepted in their own place. Familiarity blinds people to their message. I know who he is and he has nothing to say to me. Jesus then gives two rather provocative examples. During a great famine in the time of the prophet Elijah, he was sent to help not his fellow Israelites, but a poor widow. Sidon was one of the oldest Phoenician cities on the Mediterranean coast and about 33 kilometres north of Tyre. Later, Jesus would heal the daughter of a Gentile woman here. And in the time of the prophet Elisha, there were many lepers in Israel, but he was sent to cure Naaman, a Gentile general from Syria. God reaching out to Gentiles through his prophets sets the stage for the Gentiles to receive the message of the prophet Jesus, which is so much a theme of Luke's writings. But these remarks so angered the people of Nazareth that they dragged Jesus to the brow of a hill with the intention of throwing him down, but he just walked through them. Whether he did this miraculously or from the sheer power of his personality is not clear. In any case, his time had not yet come. Prophetic voices being rejected by their own is a phenomenon only too common in our own day. And it was something Jesus foretold would happen to his followers, simply for being his followers and proclaiming his vision of life. So in the meantime, let us make Jesus' mission statement our own. Let us do our best to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are hurt. That's what being a Christian means. Let us pray. So we pray for Jesus to heal us and to make us whole, the wholeness that is holiness and the holiness that is wholeness. We pray that the health and the well-being of our nation, that all who are fearful and anxious might be at peace and free from worry. Lord, hear us. We pray for the isolated and the housebound, that we may be alert to their needs, and that we may care for them in their vulnerability. Lord, hear us. We pray for our homes and our families, for our schools and young people, and all in any kind of need or distress. Lord, hear us. We pray for a blessing on our local community, that our neighbourhoods may be places of trust and friendship, where all are known and cared for. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God as we join in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all those you love and all those for whom you pray, this day and forevermore. Amen. Stay safe and God bless.